meeting with the golf advisory committee. Um, and, uh, and once again, I did not make that meeting. So uh, I'm going to abstain. But is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Second from Kurt. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. All right. Passes. Um, before we uh, uh, before we before we go to the third uh, order of uh, on the agenda, I just want to recognize uh, uh, our f now former board member Dan Jassica. Um, uh, Dan uh, served on the park board, I'm going to read this, since August of 2012, did a terrific job. During that time, he was very thoughtful in looking all ad at agenda items from the resident standpoint and ensuring transparency from all board discussions and actions. During his time, topics such as the new boat basin dredge dredging policy was implemented, Forest Park project began, uh, the Kemper Sports hybrid golf contract was implemented, and numerous capital and athletic field improvements were made. Dan also devoted additional time to serving recently on the Lake Forest Lake Bluff Joint Recreation Task Force in order to research possibilities for shared services that increase in efficiency and opportunities that would benefit residents from both communities. Um, personally, uh, I found Dan's uh, input um, you know, very useful very constructive. Uh, Dan continues to be a, a terrific member of our uh, community. Dan has uh, taken a judgeship, which prevents him from holding other public offices. So he has resigned uh, from the board. Um, we wish him very well. We're lucky as uh, citizens to have people of his caliber serving in that capacity, and we uh, and we uh, thank him for his faithful um, and exemplary service here at the board. Um, with that, I'm going to move to item uh, number three on the agenda, which is an opportunity for citizen, citizens to address the Park and Rec Board on non-agenda items. Are there citizens who would wish to, uh, is, that, is that a hand up? Yes. Hand up, okay. Uh, my name is Rich Chapman. I'm um, Rich, do you want to, yeah, come up and uh, if you stand over here, uh, we, can, we can all see and hear you and... Uh, Use the uh, microphone there. My name is Rich Chapman. I live at 1090 Southwest Fork Drive, Lake Forest. I'm the Commodore of the Lake Forest Yacht Club. And I wanted to speak up on behalf of the uh, Recreation Department and more specifically Hunter and his contribution to the sailing program over the last 10 years. Um, the Yacht Club has benefited from his presence and his contribution. He has supported us immensely. Um, evenings, he's, he's sailed against us. I mean, he's been very, very involved, and we wanted to support him and recognize him. And the second part of that was to express our desire that the, um, that the Recreation Department find a suitable candidate to replace him that is of the same caliber that Hunter is. Uh, and that may be difficult, and it may be that you need to search a little bit, but we wanted to encourage that because he's done a tremendous job to make Lake Forest the national recognition. I mean, we're, we're, we, do, we host the uh, junior, uh, junior Olympics every other year. I mean, we're, our, our sailing teams, both for the rec department and for the high school, are recognized around the country. And a good bit of that is the result of contribution that Hunter made. And I wanted to make sure that the, that the board understood how valuable that position is. Appreciate that very much, Rich. Thank you. Yes, Rich. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, are there any other uh, comments from, from the public that, on topics that are not on our agenda today? All right. Um, could I just add, um, I thought Mr. Chapman would like to know, we did receive approval today from the city manager to move forward with filling that vacancy. So we'll start our, our search oh. process. So that's good Terrific. news. Terrific, yeah, yeah. I, I know, uh, Rich, before you made that comment, um, Mary and I had a conversation earlier this week and she, she uh, went, during which she shared her, uh, the fact that Hunter had left and um, had, had left for personal reasons, nothing to do with with his satisfaction with the city or, or anything. And, um, and, and she uh, reiterated some of the things that you had just said uh, uh, about his service 
you know, to the city and and all the difference that he had made. And and she said he's going to have some. He's, his shoes are big to fill, but uh, you know we're going to try. So appreciate that comment. An another comment. Yeah, the other thing I'd like to add on this Scott Herman loves Hunter Kimberly. Yes, uh, Scott Herman, 1100 Inverleith, uh, rear commodore of Lake Forest Yacht Club. Um, Rich summed it up perfectly for what we have to say about Hunter, but I'd like to point out I'm also a board member of the Judd Goldman Adaptive Sailing Foundation. As some of you know, we brought in an adaptive sailing program here completely under the tutelage of Hunter. Uh, the boat came up, I believe, two seasons ago. It's an extremely active boat. We're getting um, attention not only from Milwaukee all the way to the city. Uh, we'd like to see that continue. So someone that you bring in, if they can have some um, uh, at least um, understanding of how that program works. Um, the board, I know the Judd Goldman board will, will graciously reach out and help. Um, we've had some great instructors that have been underneath Hunter. Hunter himself brought the program here, but we've had, uh, I believe the gentleman this year's name was Will. He ran the program. Um, and they, it's never heard a complaint. It's been phenomenal. So we'd like to continue the momentum that we have here, not only in the adult program through the Lake Forest Yacht Club, but also in the youth program with that national recognition, um, like Rich mentioned. So um, it's going to be hard to find someone. Um, obviously, we can do a HR type search internally of the city. We know you guys have found great people before. You've got Brian Hill in the past. You got Joey Harris, who's a phenomenal a person as well. But those people are willing to help out if we need uh, review on uh, the sailing side of resumes and things. There's people in the community that would like to help to make sure we bring in the right people to continue this program and the momentum going forward. Well, appreciate that. I mean, I, I, from my standpoint, uh, any any help we can get is uh, looks like help to me. So okay. Well, there's people here to help, so thank you. Thanks, Scott. All right. Um, Mary, we're going to move to item number four, which is, which is your presentation on the Deer Path Golf Course Future Management Structure. Good evening, board, and thank you for the opportunity for uh, me to bring you um, some information related to Deer Path Golf Course and um, the structure that we are considering um, and looking at for the future management. Um, I have uh, some slides I'm going to walk you through uh, for the benefit not only for the park board, but those of you who are um, from home or have joined us tonight related to the golf course. And um, First, I just wanted to mention that our golf course was established in um, 1927, so it has been a community recreational amenity um, for 87 years, and that's quite a testament to um, you know, the long service and the value that it's had. It is uh, provided year-round recreational service, not only golf, but we use the golf course throughout the year, a lot of residents for cross-country skiing or just enjoying uh, the winter months in that open space, and also plays a very critical role in the community for floodplain. Um, it is uh, bounded, as you know, uh, on the south side by Deer Path Road. Um, to the east is the Skokie River, and to the west is Route 41, and on the north side is uh, Lake Forest Open Lands property. So it is in a really wonderful central location in the community, and um, it plays uh, a vital role, I think, then for the community for many different aspects. Um, um, it was a property that was deeded over to the city. Various parcels were um, given to the city, and it was at that time indicated in the deeds that it was to be used for public park and recreational purposes, with the exception of trap shooting. They seemed to not really want trap shooting back in 1927. It shows up in a number of the, the restrictions for all the various parcels. So, um, And then goes on and the, the property deed showing that if it should cease to operate as a park or a recreational space, it would be returned back to the grantors of the property for their heirs or them to um, see fit. To, to do as they will. So um, it is a unique property in that respect, and it's not one that the city, um, you know, can just convert and do, you know, can build something new there, like make it residential or what have you. So um, that's just a little bit of the background I thought would be good to start with on the golf course. Um, knowing that golf, the golfing industry overall uh, was beginning to uh, face some challenges and uh, shortly after I arrived here, I arrived in 2007, uh, we worked with a group called Pelusa Corporation, Edge Hill Golf Advisors, and we asked them at that point in time to do an operational review of Deer Path Golf Course. Um, and so they did come in and they did this uh, review 
overview for us and um, based on that and where we were you were really beginning to see a lot of the economic uh, downturn and stress happening around that time and the golfing industry in particular began uh, to be challenged um, we held a community forum in October of 2010 and we kind of use this as an opportunity to educate the community on what is the state of the industry then and what was on the horizon for Deer Path Golf Course because we projected back in 2010 even that there would be financial challenges for the golf course that had not previously existed um, and so that that started the community forum um, discussions and so we went in 2011 and we had the Nas National Golf Foundation do a further review not only of just kind of the um, clubhouse operations but more of the entire operations and they provided us a business report in February 2011 and um, that was very helpful for us because that was on the junction of uh, where uh, we knew that our um, Golf Course Pro for a long time was uh, approaching and you know considering retirement, and we had seen the um, the uh, challenges continue for golf. It had not changed directions at that point in time and then um, and so that August we also held another community forum and we talked about what was being investigated and that led us into um, in fall of 2012 which I'm going to come back to and touch upon in a minute a uh, process that we went through for requests for qualifications and an RFP um, process for assistance to help us with managing our course because at that time Chris Marzalek who was our golf pro did retire um, and so we had an opportunity on our horizon and we continued that community outreach through January 2013 and since that date we've had a number of park board and or city council reports provided on kind of how the golf season's going what have we done what has Kemper who's been working with us um, what impacts have they had and so we have really um, had conversations about the golf course and its performance beginning as early as 2008 and leading up to today and so this next chart, um, though somewhat hard to read, is a little bit of a what I call a flash report and just kind of gives you some industry background on it. And I want to start with the, um, the, the slide that's, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Hang on. Um, where's my pointer? I want to make sure I get the pointer. Where's the pointer part? Oh, we're getting right in the middle. Okay. Um, is it doing it? Okay. This slide right here I wanted to mention, um, first of all, this is a slide that shows Lake Forest, which sits in right here, and the competition that we have in a 30-mile radius of, of Deer Path. Um, currently, there are 81 courses, municipal, you know, uh, private as well as um, like forest preserve or semi-private in our competition radius so that's quite a few um, golf courses however um, having said that um, you know we've uh, there's not that many um, we're pr primarily surrounded I should say by private courses in Lake the Lake Forest area but we do have municipal golf courses with almost all of our surrounding neighboring partners so um, we've got a lot of private um, but we do seem to have like Lake Bluff, Deerfield, Highland Park all have a municipal course as well. Um, the next uh, area that I wanted to touch upon was more of the rounds information and that's on this side of the slide and just a little bit about the rounds trends um, you know the uh, Deer Pass rounds, which is the green bar um, on this slide, is we have, this is a uh, 2011, 12, and 13 slide that kind of gives you um, a rounds average for the PGA in the Chicagoland area. So really looking at us and how we fit in the Chicagoland market. And as you can see there, uh, we did really well um, compared to the military and um, daily fee, semi-private kind of clubs as far as um, our rounds trends. And um, the bottom chart here, shows Deer Pass history um, really state going back all the way to 2009 and we've hovered around a little over 30,000 rounds consistently um, over the last five years the 2014 that's up there um, really is just a year to date so we we're in that golf season right now and that will bar will go up and probably hopefully take us closer to um, what is the, the average that we've been at over the last few years so from a rounds perspective um, Deer Path I feel 
uh, has continued to have good usage. Um, it's, it's outperforming many of the other golf courses in the Chicagoland area, um, but that's still not to say we don't have some challenges. Um, and then the final chart that's here on the bottom was really total revenue per rounds. And this is, uh, again, a chart, Deer Path is in the green, and it kind of shows where we fall with our daily revenue um, you know, per round. And Deer Path, again, we were not doing really well with our revenue per rounds. Um, as much as we would have liked prior to 2011, and that was because we did not use dynamic pricing then. So when we started the dynamic pricing, which is an uh, item that Kemper helped us implement, that allowed us to float the daily fee range based on peak times and non-peak times and really be able to market and draw in more players to the golf course. So um, from that, uh, we have been really done, we've done very well with our, our per round revenue as well. And so that chart, I think, kind of helps illustrate um, the per round revenues. So having said that, um, again, we realized in 2011 that we really needed to step back and kind of look at what was the best structure to manage your path um, in the, over the next few years. And as a result, the city prepared what was called a request for qualifications. And we sent that out to all significant golf companies in the, uh, actually it was sent out nationally. And um, we had five companies uh, respond to that that were more in our regional area that managed everything from the private courses, very high end to just municipal kind of courses. Um, and we were very pleased with that. We chose to interview four of the requested um, for qualifications firms. And we had a committee that was um, part of that. Kurt served on that at that time, made up of aldermen, park board members, um, and uh, residents from the community as well. Um, and so I thought uh, the qualifications, we interviewed four. And then from that, it was determined that uh, maybe we wanted to do kind of a unique twist to this instead of going all fully managed by one, you know, by an outside company or a city to look at a hybrid option. So we issued an RFP, a request for proposals, um, and we invited the four companies to participate in the request for proposals that interviewed. Um, and that was really, uh, we asked them to, um, the hybrid to offer up the opportunity to provide a general manager for the course as well as to assist us with our marketing and business plan. They could also list additional non-required elements if they would want to assist us with other components, whether it was a lesson program or, um, you know, the food and beverage and that kind of thing. Um, we got those proposals back from two companies at the time, which was Kemper Sports and Billy Casper, um, did express interest in the hybrid option, and we reviewed those and interviewed those firms, and from that it was decided that Kemper would come on board with this. So Kemper came on board in 2012, and again, this just kind of highlights what I was saying, what Kemper was responsible for assisting with, which was the providing a general manager, the marketing and green fees, merchandise sales, and the pro shop. And then in 2013, we did offer them the opportunity to do food and beverage when our existing vendors contract ended. And um, we wanted to have a more seamless uh, approach to the golf course um, with Kemper there. And the city, though, continued to manage the course and the clubhouse maintenance. The rangers and starters, the golf pro shop were all our employees, and we handled accounting through the city's finance department. So though uh, Rick Walrath, who was our general manager, was a Kemper employee, he oversaw the clubhouse employees. And the maintenance, which was uh, Tom Wilson and his crews, reported to Jeff Waite, who was um, the city's staff. Um, so one of our things we started right away with working with Kemper was the revenue strategy. And these were some of the items that uh, they helped us create and you know really achieve over those three years. Um, Rebranded Deer Path um, with a new point of sale technology and a new website, which was desperately needed. If anybody remembers our old website, it was, it was uh, not much help as far as uh, information on the golf course. And we didn't have the tee time reservation online. Um, Grew revenue and outperformed performance industry trends. We wanted to increase participation from daily fee participants in order to offset what we saw was declining memberships. And that has proven true not only um, the last three years for us, but industry-wide. Memberships is on a decline nationally. Um, so that, that is a challenge. Um, you know, look at trying to improve our revenue streams from carts in the range, um, which both of those, again, we saw significant upticks in those. And then um, utilizing the T-sheet and market awareness, um, really working on customer feedback. Uh, for those of you who played golf out there, our daily fee, um, 
and players as well as members after a round they get a sat um, a true review sheet for them to fill out and give us feedback we do see those every week and we look at those and try to make adjustments as appropriate and then um, they did assume the food and beverage um, operations I already mentioned and then just to help us make a smooth transition which from the city staff perspective uh, went pretty well given we had a window there to kind of get everything in place before that very first season kicked off <laughs> Um, some of the challenges over the last three years that we have learned is that there, there are challenges to it. Um, it is a bifurcated management system with communication. As you can imagine, we almost have, we say, two, you know, two, two heads to the dragon um, and making sure everybody stays on the same page, whether it's process if there's a rain out and there's been a lot of rain on the course, we want carts to go out or not, and who's making that call to other things as far as what the priorities might be for doing some of the um, clubhouse uh, uh, improvements there. Um, it's hard to build a dynamic team when you have different employers and different expectations and making sure we all stayed on the same page with that. Um, there's programming challenges with multiple vendors um, as well and just who's ordering, who's returning the merchandise, um, credits, that kind of thing that come into the financial side of it. Um, and then I would mention too, it's been a little challenging because uh, Kemper works on a golf season reporting process uh, uh, approach and the city staff works on a fiscal year so we always are trying to make sure our numbers jive with each other and that we can align reports that are coming out to the park board and council and that can be challenging as well um, and then the last item I have up there is the capital planning and prioritization um, you know we we've had very little dollars for that purpose uh, in the last few years so it hasn't been that big of a challenge but um, you know we do want to uh, continue to reinvest in the course and that could be um, an issue so having said that um, we started talking because we are coming to the end of the three-year um, contract with Kemper um, to really understand where we've been financially and, and what is um, what opportunities do we have if we had a different structure and this slide that's up there that was in your packet is the Deer Path golf course history from 2007 through 2000 uh, fiscal year 14 and I want to call your attention um, primarily to the yellow line the first yellow line that's on here and that was um, is the line that's the net before capital and debt so this this chart above that shows our operational revenues less our expenses and then what the net is before we input our capital and debt and really um, we had a positive class cash flow on operations all the way through 2014 though you can see it it declined significantly over time we had you know started at 512 and then uh, last year we were at thirty seven thousand um, uh, dollars we're going to be in a deficit this year we believe in 15 um, primarily because we've had not had the greatest weather this year and so we've been challenged a little bit with that and we've had some unexpected expenses that we had to address uh, related to our irrigation computer system and a few unknowns so um, so that will be at a deficit this year um, the second yellow line up here is the net after capital and debt and so that kind of shows you what um, what starts to happen here when you have the capital and debt in the course which will not go away until 2023 for the debt and um, so we still have debt on the course and it also shows the capital and we have been stepping kind of back down on the capital we started at 115,000 I was here and we've you know kind of stayed um, I'm sorry 141,000 and we've had a few years where we didn't do any capital to try to keep um, uh, the the deficit and the or I should say the fund transfer having to be too high and then we've done a few basic pieces of equipment in the last two years so um, so that's that's um, the history since 2007 so you can see that was the kind of slide that we were concerned about the start of the conversations that um, really kicked off back in 2008 and um, again a lot of this is is not uh, the operational concerns of deer path so much as what's happening in the world around us lots of competition declining members of golfers and the recession that hit in in 2008 and you can see um, that the first year that we had a fund transfer that had to come over from uh, recreation was in um, 
uh, 2011, and that's on the slide right here. We brought in 22,000 from the Recreation Department. In order to meet our debt service requirement, we have to have 125% um, operating income in excess of debt. And so we had to start bringing money over from the Rec Fund in order to meet our debt obligation requirements. Um, and so each year that has continued to go up. This last year it was 96,000, and we expect to be uh, certainly over $100,000 uh, this year. So moving on, um, really talking about the future management options, which is where I know um, the most of the, the question is for everybody here in the audience as well as for the park board is, um, so we started to look at some goals and I won't go through all these. I think they're really um, evident that we want to be the best golf course there is. We want to be competitive. We want to be efficient and effective. And, you know, we want to be open and transparent and keep our, our golf course uh, patrons aware of where we're headed with things. So that that was just some goals that we had uh, for this next step. But what we really saw was an opportunity here to bring it all back together under one umbrella and gain efficiencies, um, looking at it from we could improve communication, which leads to help you know improving service. There would be efficiencies, whether they're financial or performance. Um, we could do cross training with all of the staff in because um, they would all you know be uh, uh, communicating with each other. Um, we have market-based program benefits, and we thought that there would, might be better opportunities for better fiscal performance as well. So in order to do that, um, what we did was, um, and I didn't put this up here as a slide, but I'll mention it, but the park board got it in your packet, is we did an apples to apples line item budget for fiscal year 16, looking at every single line item in our budget, and we asked Kemper to do the same, and then we met and we tried to see where we could align our revenues, our expenses, or where we differed, and used that agreed upon uh, line item budget in order to do a five-year projection out under different scenarios and the biggest thing we learned from the line item budget was um, we were the city always approaches its revenues from a very conservative approach we look at the current year performance the one that we're in right now and we look at the past year and really try to um, assume a simple you know a uh, we're going to continue the course as it is a little bit. And we, we always take the very conservative on revenues. And then the expense side of it um, is really driven largely by the city and our wage and our pension and our insurance costs. And that became very apparent in looking at the differences with Kemper's uh, line item budget. Uh, they were, um, they do a little more of a three year industry average as well as looking at deer path with rhythms with weather factored in on from a national um, knowledge basis and they were a little more um, aggressive with revenues especially in daily fee they felt they could continue to grow daily fee revenue well and they were significantly less costly when it came to um, benefits uh, and wages so that was where the divide started to happen in the financial performers so we did run four different performers um, we ran it as city managed which would mean we use the city revenues projections we used our city expenses and we ran it looked at it from five years out um, and I'm gonna flip through them just real quick I'll come back but we looked at them as Kemper managed which was Kemper revenues and Kemper expenses plugged in then we decided to look at it from the other side of the coin if we used Kemper's revenues but the worst case scenario of city expenses and then we looked at it from city revenue which is conservative with Kemper's expenses so when you start to do that, um, it really becomes, uh, I'm going to go back to the first one, really becomes evident that under a city managed system, this would be all employees are the city, so we'd rehire a general manager um, that would be an employee of the city, and the city continue to have all staffing costs and can uh, do the debt and everything. When we looked at that scenario, you can see here, starting with the 14 was the preliminary. Um, this is the budget year we're in. But when you look out, we are still going, we're going to be in a deficit net before we've even put capital and debt into the mix. And then once you put capital and debt into the mix, it really accelerates quite quite high and it goes over $220,000 a year. And that is very challenging for the recreation department to do a fund transfer of that volume over. But it is, um, 
you know, this is, again, looking at it uh, fully city managed. So the next scenario is, is Kemper managed. And this would assume that Kemper has all of the staff. Um, they're all their employees. Um, the, uh, the capital and debt is still in there. The city is responsible for capital and debt. So it is still plugged into the expense line item, but it, it's in there as well. And it includes a um, dollar amount in order for the city to pay Kemper to assist us with uh, managing the course. And they're projecting it as 4% of, of revenues annually. And that comes out to around 60, um, $63,000 a year. So that's when you do that scenario and you look at the yellow lines, the net before capital and debt starting in 16 stays positive um, all the way out and through the next five years. But when you put the capital in debt, we are still in a negative balance. However, at a much significantly lower amount, $120,000, you know, in, in 16, dropping down to, you know, around $50,000 five years out. So a much less significant requirement of fund transfers to the rec department, um, from the rec department. So when you look at the other scenarios, I'm not going to go through them. They fall in the middle there. You know, there's second and third place, if you will, as far as um, what those um, what those prove out. But in order to do one of, you know, we could do either one of uh, any of these scenarios up here. But um, the board would want to give us some direction um, if we move forward with one of these that use Kemper's revenues, but use city's expenses or use, you know, use city's revenue and Kemper's expenses so that we can get a sense of what is the risk um, tolerance, I guess, the park board, and then we would bring that to council's interest when we prepare budgets this year. Um, so uh, that's, I won't go through all of those, but those are the kinds of things we would still need to talk about. Um, so when you put all of the net after capital and debt, and this is before you bring in the subsidy from the rec department, this graphically shows those four spreadsheets and what that looks like. So the red is, is a fully Kemper managed, and you can see it stays at the, you know, the, the least uh, financial um, uh, subsidy required. And then you go to the next level, which was um, the uh, city revenue Kemper um, I'm sorry, Kemper revenue, city expense, and so on. Um, so I just think that was a very visual, helpful slide to see. It does make quite a bit of difference when you look at the dollar amounts that are on the left-hand side here and where the, you end up when it's a city-managed operation. And uh, so that's those. Um, so really, um, the question before the park board is, and you know, this discussion for you is, is <coughs> Uh, financially, what's best interest for the course, uh, customer service delivery, you know, what's in the best interest of the course. Um, you know, I, I feel as staff, we certainly learned a lot over the last three years of things that worked well and things that didn't work well. Um, I think our courses remain very competitive. Um, I'm still a diehard fan of Deer Path Golf Course, and I think it should exist and remain, you know, and tremendous asset, hopefully for many, many, many decades for the community. Um, and so, I, and I don't think that is really a concern right now with the park board either um, but really the question is what kind of management structure you know is is in the best interest for the golf course um, uh, given the the challenges that we have today and with that i'll conclude my um, my presentation and just see if i can answer any questions for the park board or guys you have any questions I just have one for clarification, Mary. If Kemper came on in the fall of 2012, we're approaching this end of the second year of the three-year contract, correct? End of the third year. They came on in December of 2011, so they did the 12, the 13, and 14 season. It's, you're confusing fiscal year with golf season, probably. Okay, I thought the presentation said they came on in the fall of 2012. No, they came in... Um, I'm we had a golf season 12, 13, and 14. Yeah, that's, they came, so it's fiscal year uh, 12. Point is, the contract is terminating at the end of this calendar year? Correct. Thank you. Yes, so we're done, oh, we're done we're December started. 6th of this year, the term, the contract ends. Yeah, so we, we're in the final third year of the contract with them. So our fiscal year ends April? Right, April 30th. So fiscal 12 would have started in May of 11. Correct. That would have been their first year. 
Right. So they started in May of 12, or actually March in 12, and then they continued through the golf seasons from there on. Does that make sense? But I thought it was three seasons. I thought that, I thought, this is the third season. This is the third season. Am I, so we're in 12, 13, and 11. This is the third season. Go back to, and that was their first season. Right, right. Okay. Am I saying this right? We got it. I feel like I'm talking Greek. Right, um, other, yes. Other so this questions? is the final. This is we're in the final season with them, which is why we needed to have the conversation about it going forward. And it was both the park board and <coughs> Kemper talking that um, you know felt that the hybrid was not the most suitable structure if we you know were ending and wrapping up this current contract. Yeah. To to be clear, there were concerns on both sides, and I believe Kemper has expressed. Um, that they would not want to continue in the current structure. Correct. That would be correct. Uh, Kemper's here. I don't want to speak exactly for them, but yes, that's communication how many, to us. How many golf courses does Kemper take care of on a comprehensive basis? Would one? Would you like to come? Come on up, Steve. Joining us uh, tonight, we have Steve Skinner, who's the CEO of Kemper, as well as Ben Blake, uh, Mike Williams, and Rick Walrath. Uh, we have about 110 properties in 31 states. Okay. In and and how, how many in the Chicago area then? In the Chicago, in the state of Illinois, I think there are about 16 or 17. In the Chicago area, I think 14 or 15. Uh, and of our 110, about 35% are municipal golf courses. I see. Other questions from ever, anybody else? Uh, Mary, I have a question about operationally how this would work. Uh, work Kemper to take it over from a from a financial standpoint. For example, who does the accounting for the golf course? Well, that is one of the items we would need to work out as part of the contract in the next couple of months. Um, there's a couple options, ways you can do that. Um, it, the city, you know, still maintains control of the course from the <coughs> perspective of weighing in on what the fees would be charged, um, setting the expectations for how the course is maintained, et cetera. Um, and the one of the questions is how we want the books to to be op, you know to operate. Um, we're looking at both both scenarios of whether Kemper runs and handles all of the revenues and expenses and then can you know put it through their bank accounts, but yet provide uh, monthly check registers and you know expenses to the city as well as revenue reports, um, or whether or not it runs through the city accounting. Uh, department. I would say that the city accounting department poses some challenges when you're in that environment just because, again, um, we don't have as quick a turnaround on providing I, I don't, reports. I actually don't as, view that as a, I think if they're managing it, they should account for it and we should have audit rights. So that that is under discussion. I, I don't know which way it'll go because we haven't gotten into the the contract details per se yet because we're still wanting to discuss you know the the operations part of it okay any other questions okay. from the uh, full management perspective what all is that going to include um, they would they would um, provide all the staff. Um, so what they would do, and Kemper, correct me if I don't uh, speak properly for you, but um, they would um, offer any existing employees an opportunity to apply for positions with their company. They would then vet them based on Kemper's expectations and how it would fit within the culture of Kemper. And our employees would have that opportunity, you know, to. to stay with your path golf course potentially or not um, and that would happen in time for them to we'd want to get a contract in place um, in time for them to be able to do that late fall going into the winter so the course would be staffed for the next season um, they would in addition be responsible for all the agronomy and all the maintenance of the course and they do you know have a very uh, broad and very uh, qual highly qualified agronomy division that can really uh, hopefully assist us with uh, support for our greens uh, you know needs as well as um, course conditions and I know um, it's been a challenge the last few years with all the crazy storms and you know the winters that have been harsh and cold and, and it 
you know, that's really important to have a really strong department related to that. Uh, they would maintain the equipment that would be utilized. It would be city equipment for the most part. Um, that would be something that has to be fleshed out on how the equipment side of it would work, but potentially they would repair equipment and do all the preventative maintenance, et cetera. So the course would run seamlessly all underneath their management of that. And, and um, the city could support that if, let's say they needed to do something that needed a lift, you know, and they could come over to our, our fleet division and then it would be a per hour kind of uh, accounting of, of that kind of work. But um, they, would, they would do basically, in essence, the entire course operations, rangers, uh, food and beverage, pro shop, and maintenance. How many breakdown of full-time versus seasonal employees do we have right now? Currently we have um, two full-time, which is um, in the maintenance division, and we have a uh, total of 20 seasonals between pro shop and maintenance division. And then Rick is not our employee, but you have the general manager provided by Kemper. Steve uh, Skinner, would, would you care to come up and, and – uh and just speak on behalf of Kemper in this issue. This is obviously a very, uh, you know, it's a big deal, uh, the a potential partnership with your company. We want to hear what you have to say about that. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, you weren't there. We had a, a great session a few weeks ago uh, with the board and the public uh, workshop and talked through a lot of these issues. And, and I thought, I think Mary uh, did a very nice job uh, uh, as many of you know, most of you know, I'm a lifelong resident of the uh, city of Lake Forest and care a lot about the community and about the golf course. And <clears throat> we've enjoyed the relationship with the city these last three years. And to answer your question earlier, we try never to say no to a client when you ask the question, would we be interested in going forward with the hybrid option? In this case, I honestly feel whether it's with us or someone else, the hybrid option really isn't the best choice for the city, isn't the best choice for the golf course especially if you need to get to the next level and try to reach a point of financial stability and self-sufficiency. There are just, it's, it's worked very well. We've worked very well with Jeff and Mary uh, and their team and the city staff is great. There's just too many moving parts, too many you know, conflicting agendas. And I think we can run a far more efficient operation under one operator sharing staff uh, and the like and provide best, better customer service programs. So, you know, I think a vast majority of our, if we have 40 plus municipal management agreements around the country, almost all of them are a seamless one management uh, situation. There are one or two exceptions where the uh, city still uh, keeps the maintenance staff. And it's just, in our experience, it's not the most efficient operation. And, you know, the times in the golf business, Deer Path isn't unique all over the country. Over the last 20 years, we've seen a 20% increase in golf courses and no increase in golfers. And so the issues you're facing, uh, you see all over the country in every community. And I think to give the Deer Path the best chance to succeed, the best choice is to get in one uh, set of operation, make the team truly accountable uh, for all area of the aspects, for the financials, for the golf course conditions. And I think it's important to note in these circumstances, a lot of questions we get does bringing a management company in, does the city lose control? And I think it's important. I think Mary had a chart. The city still main, con, maintains control of setting the vision, setting the policies, approving rates, approving the budget. But then once they do that, they turn it over to the management company to really run it day to day and make those decisions to operate it most efficiently. So it's not a case of the city. Uh, and I think hopefully we built that trust over the last three years where we work closely with the Golf Advisory Board, closely with uh, the Park and Rec Board and going through issues, sometimes ad nauseum going through issues and jointly making decisions. Uh, and it's really, we're here to represent the city and run the uh, property as efficiently as possible, so. But. Terrific, thank you, Steve. Um, from my perspective, you know, all of these projections, Mary, that you've put up um, are, uh, are just that. And uh, one thing I've noticed through my uh, business career about forecasts is that they're um, always wrong. <laughs> um, they, they, uh, which doesn't mean they're not useful. You need um, our finance department to help you. 
<laughs> but but you know, having said so, so to me, I would almost set those aside. I mean, I do think it, it appears there's a financial advantage to moving to um, to out of house uh, management, and uh, uh, and it's fairly obvious to see why. On the other hand, it's really important to me uh, conceptually that we um, we put course management in the right in the right hands. Um, and I'm not sure it's it's necessarily an obvious and clear answer, uh, but it does reassure me that you know Kemper's been here for three years and they've I think they've done a terrific job. I think the numbers would suggest that, um, and uh, and and certainly they have uh, a lot of experience and a lot of leverage uh, with a national organization that's doing this kind of thing. So. Um, Anyway, other comments from the group? Yeah, I, I guess um, my concern is is whether or not uh, is the city could, if we take it over ourselves, how well we can handle the marketing aspect. Because I, what we've seen is over the last three years there's been an improvement. And, and on the city managed side, we're locked in with a hundred plus thousand dollar a year differential just on the benefits side. And so that's always gonna be there. Uh, and and probably get worse again. My on the revenue side, my concern is whether or not uh, we have the wherewithal uh, to do as well on the on the revenue maintenance and, and generation side as as Kemper does. Hmm. I think the um, session we had on August 28th was really good as well. I agree with Steve. It really gave us an opportunity to dig deep into these numbers and understand what's going on and understand the projections and differences and assumptions and everything. And I want to thank you and Mary and Jeff for being so responsive in the packet that you sent out to us last week, because there were lots of questions that came out of that meeting that in my mind are, are thoroughly answered at this point. For example, I raised the question, can we legally award a, or revamp the contract with Kemper without rebidding? And we got a clear answer to that. Yes, we can. I raised the question, uh, was Kemper the clear best choice the last time we ran the RFP process? And the answer is a resounding yes, they were. Um, and I think as I think about this from a financial perspective, clearly the Kemper full management option is the best option. I think from a golfer experience perspective, the Kemper full managed option is the best option. And I think from a risk management perspective, where it's acceptable for the city to take on this model because of the reasons Steve cited, we still maintain control over the budget, capital decisions, et cetera. So based on all the discussions we've had, all the, de the data you've provided, the answers to our questions, I'm very comfortable recommending the Kemper full management option to the city council. So can we make that an official motion then, Kurt? I, you need a most Steve, um, I don't know if you, I think you have some people here from oh, the audience you know if what? you'd like to have you know them what? have a chance I, I jumped to, the gun. I jumped to the gun. make any comments. I jumped the gun. So there is a fair amount of uh, 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 support for that direction, but um, I would be uh, remiss without, because I know there are a number of people here from the, from the community. Um, does anyone have anything they'd like to uh, share relative to this issue? Uh, who's in the audience now? Any comments from the, sure, come on up. Good evening, I'm uh, Sean Walsh, 140 Park Avenue. Hi, Sean. And I'm a uh, going on about 20 year uh, player out at Deer Path. And uh, when we first considered having an outside management company come in, I think everybody was very nervous about it, concerned, and didn't want to give up our old deer path that we were used to. And um, I think everybody was concerned, and, and uh, as, as much as they said, you know, it's, nothing's going to change, it's all going to be, it's all going to work out very well. I think everybody was concerned. Well, in this now, our third year, I will say that everything I feel has worked absolutely fabulously. Um, They've done a really, really good job in not only keeping a lot of the traditions alive, but also um, what, you know, the permanent tea time structure was, I think, something that um, people were concerned with. Um, and, and that has worked 
fabulously, not, you know, no real changes. Matter of fact, I think one of the biggest concerns was being, making sure that the times were being filled and um, Rick and his staff has done a great job with that. Over the last four years, I've uh, juggled um, up to 24 golfers that um, is, is our group and every week we have to get uh, a yay or a nay whether they're in or they're out and we do that by Wednesday which never is ever working correctly, but we've worked on an email system with Rick, letting him know who's playing, who's not. Matter of fact, he's copied on the emails now, so he knows uh, who everybody is through nickname only. He doesn't know anybody's true Christian name, but he, he, <laughs> he at least can recognize an email or a, uh, a nickname with a face. So um, from, from that standpoint, the, the permanent tee times, I think has worked really, really well. They've been uh, able to move some things around when people don't get the times they want and being able to fit people in. And they've also been able to fill up those times with, um, uh, with outsiders, which again was a concern, but they've been able to do a fairly good job on keeping the golf course and the pace of play moving you know, to, to what everybody expects, ex except maybe one or two groups that aren't as concerned with it, you know, aren't, aren't as happy with as way stuff moves. But um, I, I, think, I think just in a general uh, statement, everybody knows what's happening with the, with the golf industry and the rounds. This is what these guys do. I mean, they, they manage golf courses. They fill in times. They get people out there. We're, we're amazed. We, there are a lot of faces out there that we, you know, we've never seen before but um, they're getting people to come to the golf course. And, and they're getting them to come at a time when it's not really affecting, I think, you know, the members or the, when the people want to play early and play and, and get done. So um, I, I, think, uh, I, I think the full option will just be that s a step that much better for us. Um, they, towards the middle to the end of the year, they really took hold of the, of the food and beverage and, and we've had some struggles with that, which you know, I think that they will admit, but I, I think just giving them control of that will help that move forward. And um, I, I think overall it, it, would be, it would be wise to go that route. Uh, like I said, I think that's what they do. Uh, that's their specialty. And uh, I think they're in it, you know, they would be in it 100%. Um, the city, I, you know, I don't know if they have the resources or the time or as, uh, as Charlie said, you know, the marketing budget or the, you know, the, the knowledge to really go after that and give it 100%. So mm. um, as, a, as a long time or almost 20 year player there, I've been very happy with the, with the people and, and the uh, services that they've provided and I think they're doing a great job. So Appreciate that's my it, recommendation. John. Thank you. Thank you. That's good perspective from someone who's been doing it for a long time. And maybe wasn't all that convinced at the beginning. Other comments uh, from residents here, folks in the audience? Sounds like there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of silent head nodding then. All right, Mary, um, am, am, I, uh, am, I, am I okay going to, uh, to motion? I think um, the, the, the staff has presented uh, uh, presented options. Um, the staff is not making a formal recommendation, um, uh, but we as a board, I think, um, need to one way or the other. So uh, is there a motion? Yes, I, I move that the park board recommend to the city council that we adopt or begin negotiating a contract with Kemper Sports Management for a full management option at Deer Path. How's that, Mary? That's good. Okay. Second. And a second from David. Um, All right, so let's do a, we'll do a roll call. Yes. Uh, Chairman Hill? Aye. Member Brush? Aye. Member Douglas? Aye. Member Colmeyer? Aye. Member Volkman? Aye. Member Walker? Aye. So we have six yeas, no nays, motion carries. All right. Terrific. Um, nice job, uh, nice job, Mary, and, and uh, thank you to Kemper. Um, this will be, uh, this will be, a, a, I hope, a terrific partnership that goes way beyond the first uh, contract time period. So I guess next is to to uh, to go to the city council. Great. All right. Next on the agenda is.
What, what did, did I say something? <laughs> Jeff, you really should have worn deodorant. Today. I know, I know, right. <laughs> they don't know what they're missing. <laughs> next right. on the uh, <laughs> next on the agenda is is the uh, the annual special facility fee recommendations for uh, FY sixteen. Correct. Um, and Jeff, uh, wait, who's already, who's champing at the bit, Cha I Jeff, am, you, I am. you got it's it. Kind of a, it's a, it's a difficult it. act to follow, Mary. But so this is I'll for the lakefront, and this is for the fitness center. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Um, so um, every year we come before the park board to make a recommendation uh, for fees. Um, then that recommendation goes over to city council for a formal uh, adoption. Um, we we um, set out to request um, a fee increase or not a fee increase, and then from there we prepare our annual budgets. Um, for this year, for the, um, the lakefront, we are going to um, present um, a small fee increase so that we can cover the majority of uh, expenses like supplies, uh, utilities, and, and personnel expenses. So. Um, every year we do a, a competitive analysis. So the first thing for um, the lakefront is we look at all North Shore daily launching areas to kind of determine where we're at. And I'm sorry that that's kind of small, but um, we're, we're high um, compared to a lot of the other communities. So we go to Highland Park, um, Evanston, Wilmette, Winneka, Glencoe, Waukegan, and see where, so we're, where we're at. So um, you can see that um, we are at, at $38 for, for a resident, um, and the highest goes uh, is Waukegan in $20. $20. Uh, you and mean then the we next have our, highest? Pardon me? You mean the next highest? Yeah, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, exactly. Uh, and then our non-resident is way askew of, of everybody else um, when it comes to um, our, our, our fees. So um, the next thing that we they look at um, is to look at um, the storage of either rack or sand or compound storage. And again, we, we take those, um, in those, those communities and we try to determine where we're at um, in relation, just comparing fees to fees. So um, when we look at uh, fees for our rack storage, we're kind of like in, in the middle of the pack uh, when we're talking uh, resident fees. And then when we get into the non-resident fees, we, we start getting a little bit askew. Um, we adopted last year a policy to, to charge non-residents three times what a resident pays for. And some of the other communities have a one and a half time uh, non-resident fee. So we, so we look at what we're doing, but we, we, when we uh, look at uh, storage fees, we really look at our nearest um, neighbor, which is, is Lake Bluff. And we see that we're, um, we are, <clears throat> excuse me, for this year, we're, we are under where they are um, this year. So by $100. But then again, when we look at those non-resident So they fees, really jumped up. Yeah, and you know we prepare our fees so far, you know, so early because we here September these fees won't go in effect until February. So um, as much as we try to share information with other communities about what we're doing, sometimes we don't get that information from others, or they just haven't made those policy recommendations. So we can see that they kind of jumped up. Hey Jeff, have you done a study on what we've lost? as residents that go non-resident to other communities? What we've lost? Yeah, com residents that go somewhere else. Um, no, I, well, I can't say um, this. Um, this year, we sold um, uh, 150 watercraft permits. Um, last year, we sold 150. That's my question. Is, are, we, are, we, are residents turning away because of the price? I, I don't think so. Yeah, because uh, we have 154 permits from uh, last year, so there's not that much uh, give and take. And with the, the poor weather that we had in the springtime, the coldness of the uh, water temperature, I think that is the main factor of people not getting out on the water this year. Yeah, I would agree with that. So, um, so what we, the next um, 
exhibit, which is um, exhibit one, is we take, um, we, we see what kind of revenue increase that we're going to see with a, per, a percentage increase. Um, and the highlighted yellow um, cells are those, I'll get to those, but what we do is we just kind of calculate out what we, what we sold for this um, season, uh, expect that we're gonna see that kind of increase, that maintain that one uh, uh, for next year, and then see what, with the percentage increase, how much of a differential uh, that we're gonna see over uh, the next fiscal year. So keeping everything equal, and we're going to see a $2,228 uh, increase in revenue. And specifically, we're looking, uh, we're recommending, recommending a 2.5% increase in resident and non-resident permit fees categories, with the exception of uh, the nanny, senior caregiver, parking pass, our daily residential guest, and uh, non-resident beach access fees. Um, our, we're going to maintain the senior discount of 25%, uh, which we do for other programs and uh, services. Uh, because we are so, um, so much higher than um, our surrounding communities, we're not, going to in, we're not recommending an increase to the daily watercraft launch fees. Uh, and um, uh, no increase to the rack and um, sand uh, permits. Uh, as well. Um, additionally, uh, we did ask the board to recommend or to approve a non-resident use restriction that that was with um, re non-residents can use the uh, launch Monday through Friday, no weekends, no holidays. So we're going to request that we continue on with um, those restrictions. Jeff, curious, what how many non-residents do we have actually paying these fees and participating? And, um, where, and where are those residents from? It tells you in column four. Um, right. Um, I'll have to, you know what, I'll have to add them up, but we do keep records of where everyone comes from. I, I can uh, certainly uh, compile that information and present that at a later date. No, that one. Not a lot. Pardon? There's not a lot. No. You know, we've had, we had this discussion last year or the year before, just kind of philosophically of why we're charging so much for non-residents, and is it a case where we just don't have capacity down there to handle much more traffic than is already there? Are we? I mean, wh why do we have that big differential, unlike other communities? Um, that is a very good question. Um, we it, it was actually a lot more. Um, heavy for the non-residents in, in relation we we pulled that back because at one point there was one that was oh, almost 500 or 349 percent what a resident pays so we established a pricing differential of three times the amount because we felt that this is um our crown jewel of our our park um in our inventory it is unlike no other facility all along the North Shore, um, and I, I understand that, and, and I'm just scanning this spreadsheet that you provided, and it looks as if, just quickly, the effect of our current pricing scheme is that we have very, very little non-resident participation down there. And is there sure. an opportunity to have a more balanced fee structure to attract more non-residents to utilize that facility, or do we not have the capacity to do that? Well, at I would say at certain times we don't have capacity to, to handle non-residents. It just depends on the season. This season, we could have handled quite a few non-residents. I guess that would be a determination of the park board if they want to uh, direct me to look at an even, you know, a, a different typing uh, di pricing differential. Well, of those four that I'm seeing, I mean, are they, where are they from? I mean, are they from Wilmette? Are they from Highland Park? Lake Bluff? Um, I would have to, um, I don't have that information, but I can get that because we do Which keep line are you looking of where at, they're Scoop? coming from. Well, I'm looking at uh, water, water ramp launch non-resident was one, and then da daily boat launch non-resident three. And that's pretty much all the non-resident usage. And my, my question I guess I'm asking is, is that non-resident, are those four non-resident, are they Lake Bluff people that, or you know, where are they from? 
again, I don't have that information. I can get that to you because we do track, we do have that, a spreadsheet that has that information. It seems like we're just, we, we're pricing that non-resident out of the Our ballpark because we just yeah. don't want Did you say, Jeff, we, we, made, we made this triple determination just last year? Yes. This board did that. Right. No, we, yeah. we pulled it back. We pulled it back from three and a half times or something. Well, we, yeah. Yeah, right. For we, we established that we, or me. we narrow the gap a bit, but it's still pretty significant. Right. And we're still not having, we're having very few, if any, non residents. Right. I, I guess that's the question. Do we want that? Is that what we're trying? Are we trying to get res, non residents to participate? I, I've, you know, I have just sort of maintained um, the, the, the pricing structure and knowing that there is some. Um, desire not to have non-residents there but again I think that's a good philosophical question that the board can have as to do we want to, to have non-residents I mean more non-residents you get to the you know the increase of two and a half percent I'm not really a fan of increasing to not to residents but we're not having any non-residents I mean why was this we're just saying two and a half percent and we're not knowing we're not gonna right we anything. could have just left that we could have just left that blank sure Jeff, when you say you don't have capacity, what, what are the consequences? We're talking uh, if, parking, if, if, really. Mm -hmm. I think we're talking parking? parking down at the yeah. beach, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah and I, my uh, recollection is that we decided to not be too aggressive in right. bringing down the non-resident because of the concerns about the construction at Forest Park this year. Well, that and the fact that we actually got rid of parking spaces in the Forest Park project. Yeah, and it was a big unknown, so we said let's not be too <laughs> aggressive but maybe it's time to reconsider that well and we know and we know last year when we had a lot of nice weather we had i don't know five or six overflow days i mean really where people were parking in town and walking a mile to the beach right even i think residents. there's i think there's two different things here one is the storage you know compound itself and then there's daily launch so if you're talking daily launch, I think it's still to be seen what the impacts will be from the Forest Park construction project and the loss of parking and what that will do to boaters. Um, I know boaters have expressed, you know, to me, concerns this year with the fact that they pay, they pay additional to park down there and what was going to happen if we parked residents that couldn't park on the north end for the beach in there and they, they couldn't, you know, enjoy their boating privileges. So we did have a very cool summer. We really didn't run into any problems, so we really didn't have out think a real good test of how that lower lot might work um, from a daily launch perspective yet I think next year after we've had another summer where the parks done I think it might be a better timing to revisit you know the structure for for non-residents then I know Highland Park too is still under construction for their large Rosewood Beach um, parking lot and their water plant is being redone as well which is city owned where they launch their boats so I think there's some impacts you know that they're wrestling with as well um, so that that would just be some additional data for you know your consideration but I think we really wanted to try to make the rack storage last year more appealing to residents as well as you know anybody you'd want to bring a boat and I think um, you know we adjusted that fee last year we brought it back in a second tier of discussion to talk about the racks at that time but compound storage to my knowledge and Jeff correct me if I'm wrong but I believe we're typically very we're sold out at we're at capacity yes. yeah. yeah we're at capacity with that so we really aren't looking for people to fill in those gaps in the compound but the daily fee what about rack storage do we have capacity we for more rack last rack. year we were 75 percent yeah we're rack. we're still about we're still at that area and and the uh, sand storage we're at capacity for the sand storage so i see again i'm skimming this so i may be wrong but i see zero non-resident participation in the rack storage so is there an opportunity to bring that down to fill up that storage capacity we certainly can, yes. And I'm not sure where the um, the North Shore Sanitation District is with their plans to redo their pump station at, at Lake Bluff, because that will affect, if they do any kind of construction there, that will affect the, the Yacht Club and where they do the primary storage of their watercraft, so they'll be looking for it. But I have not heard anything of if the, when they're gonna start that project. Was there any data or, or inquiries about cost to do this and then when they were told the rate i'm sorry don't. a non-resident calls in and asks they want to store um and then they find out the rate is 
uh, of mine. I mean, well, the, the, the assistant sailing supervisor oversees the permits, and when we've had discussions, uh, he may get a, a call or two uh, a season. Um, but yeah, I mean, usually when they hear the pricing for a non-resident, yeah, they'll. I think the, 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 other, the other aspect to our fee we also mentioned is that once you get that rack storage, you also get access to the entire beach. So, because you, you get a sticker for parking for your rack storage. So, it is a way, in some ways, that circumvents what you would pay for a parking pass on the north end, which is, you know, $1,000 through the rack storage. So, we were trying to be, I think, sensitive to that as well. Um, so, which is, but again, it is an option if we want to hold fast on rack fees or you want us to visit it. We do have time, you know, to... So in other words, if if a if a non-resident pays for rack storage, whatever it is, nine hundred and forty-five dollars. No, it's sixteen hundred and twenty dollars for rack. Yep. Yes, sir. Where is that? It's sixteen twenty. Water. Right. So they're getting. Yeah. Yep. So oh, they're getting their parking. Yeah, they're getting their parking and their rack. You can park season. You can park a boat on the rack seasonally for nine hundred and forty-five dollars. But Mary, if somebody buys that, they can drive their family down, park on the south side. Correct. Yes. So it's and and then use the beach. So you, you know, it's a similar for, price of buying a parking pass on the north end. Right, for less than a thousand bucks. And they get, can use a rack. Basically, the use of the beach all summer long with your family. That's, that's probably about right. I still think it's worth looking into potential opportunity to increase revenue. We're not, we're not talking hundreds of non-residents. We're talking probably ten. Well, how many <laughs> sl how many <laughs> slots are we talking about here, Jeff? In you know that need to be filled on the on. And by the way, we could build. We could easily build another rack. There's plenty of space down there on that south uh, cove of the beach. Mm -hmm. It's very rarely, you know, there, it's very rare there's a lot of people right. down there. Depending on how you configure it, it may take out um, one of the volleyball courts, but that'd still leave two. Um, so yeah, um, how, how many, um, well, you know, Right depends. now, how many open spots are there? There's not that many, right? Um, 10 tops 10 10 to 15 i believe yeah but i'd have to double check with um the sailing supervisor double check yeah i you know the 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 point you made about lake bluff is very relevant because uh they are at some point going to redo that whole beach area and the lake bluff yacht club where there are lots of boats and kayaks and so forth is going to have to go to some temporary spot. I, I presume they'll do something up there, but maybe people will want to look down here. And I think we should probably, through that time period, consider helping them out at a severely reduced rate from triple. I agree. Yeah, yeah, we certainly can. Right. If they, if it was, we could probably we could offer extend them what. I, I think the possibilities are boundless, but. There's I mean, you know, as an example, you know, to, just to, to that point, what, what, why wouldn't it be something we'd want to consider to give Lake Bluff, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe something close to what our residents pay? Did the task force look at that? Mm -hmm. the, the task force did. The recommendation was to hold off another year um, while we collect data from both communities to identify Lake Bluff volume of usage or lake force you know usage in the two communities because we did not have consistent data collection this summer um if we're talking and, about and rates we, and ours was different because of the construction and everything so the task force is interested in looking at some reciprocal you know access or fees waivers but that is something that i would recommend that you um we will bring back to you it's on the we met with the task force um chairs this week last last week, yeah, last Friday, um, when we're putting together that report for you that has an outline of all the recommendations with a, a possible date of, you know, 
where we can bring back recommendations to you, and that is one of them. I mean, so, this is a great example. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of, of getting more people down to the beach um, and using that unbelievable facility we have. I'm always struck by how few people it seems like we have down there. Um, we got a bunch of empty spaces on that rack. We, you know, we, it'd be easy to build another half a rack and not impact anything, really, I don't think. Um, if we had to, and, and it, it's a money maker. Mm -hmm. I mean, those, those, trust me, those racks are very expensive. It's like two by fours, you know, get a couple of guys out there with a hammer and a saw and you're good. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what the rest of the board thinks, but I think that would be an easy one, um, uh, to, to offer to our, you know, an olive branch to offer to our sister community. I agree. I agree. And since we have empty spots. What's the downside? Plus, they're charging more up there, right? Right. So, um, at this point, I would recommend. I mean, you you can't just select Lake Bluff and give it to Lake Bluff, but not to other non-resident communities. You would need a formal agreement between the two communities to activate that, so you are not, in essence, discriminating against non-residents from other communities so I would again recommend that you um, either we can hold off on this it in as a as a package with other things right how did it work with the pack. golf course when we started offering resident rates to Lake Bluff um, it was reciprocal initially it was reciprocal and then Lake Bluff a couple years later pulled back and charged started charging our residents non-resident fees again but it was a reciprocal um, we could waiving make it of residence with fees, so we can go up there and pay more. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess my point here is that if you approved these fees and we come back to you, or you don't, you, you don't have to approve the fees tonight. But if you approved these fees, and we come back with a recommendations out of the task force that change these fees before we go into effect for next year, it would override what you're approving tonight as part of your conversation of task force related opportunities well, we between the, the two communities. we can make the recommendation subject to a further review. I'm not ready to approve these. I think there's more what is the, what's the reasoning of the 2.5% anyways? Why are we taking that increase? Um, well, the, we don't really have any major capital items coming up, and uh, it's a, you know just slightly above uh, the CPI, or it's above the CPI, and uh, just... I mean, do we need to take typical? it? Pardon me? Do we need to take it? Do we need to Take propose a fee? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we're always incurring, you know, additional staff costs. You, have, you know, returning staff usually gets a 2.5% uh, increase. We're still, you know, um, utility costs, supplies go up. So this is one of the few areas of the lakefront where we are gathering fees to offset all of our expenses associated with the beach and the lakefront so um but those expenses are primarily i guess i'm here in human resource type right not mm -hmm. that would be the majority of them but we do have repairs to the racks we have you know costs that will come up that may be different than this year's cost. i'm sure these sure. fees don't come close to offsetting the cost of maintaining the beach hmm. no it's just it's helping us keep pace you don't want a year where you have to jump fees dramatically, and so that's always been kind of the philosophy is you kind of keep it moving forward in a way that we can maintain a level that without having to cut other things in other areas in order to make, you know, um, services be delivered, and then that you don't get to a situation where you haven't raised fees in five, seven years, and then it's a big leap in fees. That's always kind of difficult for the, for the community to absorb, but... Um, Again, it's, I think when we're looking at here, it's, it's, they're pretty minimal uh, increases from, for 2.5% on most of them. It's the larger year-round storage that gets into the big dollars, I think, that impact us. And I don't think, wasn't it, Jeff, that you weren't recommending any increases for the, the daily launch or? That's yeah, he's got the list yeah. up there behind you of things he doesn't, yeah. he's not yeah. recommending. So uh, what in, which items in particular are you most concerned about? When what what Kurt, categories do you want yeah, us to I'll look at? What I said earlier, I just generally I, I would like us to readdress what appears to be a philosophy here that we're going to charge significantly more for non-residents across the board. And I understand that that's probably a good thing where we have issues with parking or other capacity constraints. 
but where we've got a clear opportunity to potentially draw more non-residents and increase our revenue, like perhaps the racks, let's take a hard look at perhaps levelizing that, or maybe it's 10% more for non-residents. I don't know what the answer is, but let's look at what some other communities are doing. Okay. And I really like the idea of some form of reciprocity with Lake Bluff, particularly since they're going to be doing their construction or whatever it is. And I'd like to see either the task force look at that or you look at that. And I personally am not ready to approve what's in front of us today until that additional work's been done. Okay, that's fine. We can bring it back to you in the next next month. Any other com I mean, I think the, the, the issue that's been raised is a very real one relative to uh, non-resident cost versus resident cost. And I, I, I'm curious what the rest of the board thinks about that. Anybody else have a comments about it? No, I mean, I, I think my, I bifurcate the discussion between the north side of the beach and the south side of the beach. And, it, and, and I think the, the concern is whether we're fully attracting the, the, the number of people to use the south end of the beach, which is the boat storage, which is a launch facility, and it is a watercraft sort of area. And um, I think we've probably gone a bit too far in terms of trying to make that unattractive on the, on the south end to non-residents because I think we do have a significant usage on the north end of the beach. And so I think that's, if, if, I would just encourage the staff to figure out the difference between those two pieces. I feel like we sort of amalgamate them all in and say, geez, we, we're just worried that there's gonna be too many people down at the beach. And you any, really do on have- any getting, On any given um, weekend. But I mean, everything we're talking about here is, on the, on the storage fees is people going down there and then going out onto the lake, not people going down there necessarily. And Well, and it's controllable, and, right. right? I mean, yeah, to some so. degree, you can sell a, a fixed number of permits, and when those permits are gone, whether they're resident-owned right. or, or non-resident-owned, you, you don't sell anymore because you don't have any space, any more right. space for that. So, you know, I mean, whether you can go to the grid pricing Dynamic pace pricing. Dynamic, <laughs> like we, we've done with the golf course, you know, I mean. Right. He's still out there. He's this. this is Scott, do you have a comment about sure. this? I mean, you live down there on the south side a lot, huh? Uh, south side of the beach? Please. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I, think, I think your comments on Lake Bluff are very, um, very wise because they have an exceptionally um, strong uh, sunfish fleet. When you're talking about racks, to clarify to everybody that's here, a rack, you're only going to house a sunfish, essentially, a very small dinghy sailboat. Those boats are used. They sit on the rack much more than they're used. People are going to pay a fee to store them there. They're going to use them three or four weekends a year, and that's about it. In Lake Bluff, they have approximately, I would say on a bad day, of 15 to 25 boats on a good day on a Sunday. They race um, from... Uh, someone like myself that has small children can buy two boats. They take their kid, has one boat, they go as a dad. It's a, it's a great fleet. We don't have an active sunfish fleet here. If the construction project that I know has been in discussion for at least uh, the last two years I've been here that I've, I've heard about it goes through, you will have a mass migration down here. And I think offering them reciprocity uh, would be huge as, as a city because I think it will also help build a Lake Forest fleet. They have in the last three years hosted, this last year they hosted the um, Women's World Championships, or excuse me, na Women's National Championships. They hosted the World Championships and they hosted the Men's National Championships all. Sunfish. Sunfish, but people flew in from all over the world to compete and when Lake Bluff needed help for space, they went to Waukegan, they didn't come to us. Mm. So you're bringing, the last event was a Women's uh, National event, they probably had 50 boats. Of those 50 probably, 25 traveled there's hotel restaurant expense whatnot and great exposure for the community so if you're going to look at expose at, at growing rack space um they have a great fleet and maybe when that happens we can at some point have a joint fleet i don't know how how that would go moving forward i agree with your comment in that rack space takes very little expense it takes very little space and i from my experience down there i don't think you'd have to impact the volleyball courts much to add more rack space at 900 dollars a a slot you can build a lot of rack space so i think that's accurate 
I didn't see any comments up here on raising the price of the compound storage. Uh, I know the compound storage is, um, is fairly full. It's majority of it is Lake Bluff, or excuse me, Lake Forest residents. So the, um, the non-resident fee is probably minimal. In fact, frankly, most of them are probably under the senior payment plan. Um, I know we've had a few boats add this year. In fact, the compound I think is as active as it's ever been on the sailing side. <clears throat> uh, through Hunter and Brian, we've started a Thursday night racing series. We've had as much as seven or eight boats out there on Thursday nights, all from our compound. So uh, I think that's continuing to grow. So you need to pay attention to how we're gonna price that. Um, Waukegan just redid the entire, um, the entire north side of their docks. I know that for my 25 foot boat, which with two parking passes and paying for year storage, I was um, in excess of $1,800. They're doing slip costs there this year for about 900 bucks. So maybe another 400 for um, having it on the hard, but my boat's in the water every time I go up there. Here I have to deal with cranes. I have to deal with people walking through. There's some headaches associated with using it, um, especially for our older, our older members. Mm -hmm. So to, it's not really comparing apples to apples. I also can, I'm two miles uh, in, down deer path to get to my boat here, I have to go to Waukegan. Again, that's a, a headache. So, so do you yeah. think the pricing is, is right or you think it's low? I don't think it's low for compound storage. I think it's right. I think your nervous? idea to grow the rack storage and reaching out to Lake Bluff is your, I don't believe if you lower rack pricing that you're gonna get a bunch of boats coming here. Cause I don't think a lot of people sail those kind of boats around here. If you sail a small boat, you get wet. The water's cold. Most older people don't wanna get wet and be cold. Those are kid boats for the most part, except for the Sunfish fleet that's in Lake Bluff. That's a very active fleet. And I think we'd be blessed if they would move their fleet here during their construction, because it would be great for our sailing program. Hmm. So Scott, again, looking at the data here, I, I don't believe we have any non-resident compound storage yeah, usage. That, that doesn't surprise me. And I'm just looking at seasonal compound storage resident is 1300 non-resident 30 boy i'm blind 3900 3900 3, in your opinion is there opportunity to lower that significantly and potentially fully utilize our compound storage i'm looking at you scott oh <laughs> i don't believe our compound is full I, hunter no longer is with us but every time we've had someone bring in boats we had a brand new merit 25 come in this year with a resident we had a new colgate come in uh, we had an, a, another gentleman come in with a catalina this year so we're not full that I know of. Um, I mean, we're getting close and we're as full as we've been since I've been here in five years, but there's, I'm assuming there's room to put in a boat or two more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess from my perspective, uh, the, the the discrepancy between resident and non-resident, I, I, David, I think your points are very wise. Um, there really is a difference. Um, I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure we, we, we really know what's gonna happen. Um, I, as an aside, it's related, but it's not directly related. The, uh, the Forest Park project um, is obviously not done yet. But what I can see looks absolutely spectacular, and it's going to be a tremendous improvement over where we were, and I suspect it's going to draw more people down to the beach. And I think we perhaps would be, uh, would be smart to wait and see how that looks before we do too much jiggering on, on uh, certainly uh, prices affecting the north side. Of course, a lot of what we're looking at here is just south side pricing. Um, so, um, uh, uh, is there general agreement? I'm, I'm, I know, Kurt, how you feel. Is there general agreement amongst the rest of us that we want to wait, let Jeff take a hard look at uh, uh, some, of the, some of the prices, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a potential uh, uh, reciprocation with, with Lake Bluff, um, and make sure that we're really maximizing revenue um, uh, from the standpoint of, of those of those areas where we might actually draw from out of town? Is that something we I want to agree. do? Okay, all right. Mary, you, Jeff, you okay with that? Yes, sir. Is that so, clear? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. As, just as a point for um, order here, Mary, if the, the October meeting would be a community of the whole, but 
it we would, would we would still um, be able to take action. Um, right, we would list it on the agenda that gets posted, saying that that would be an action-related item. Okay, so, fair enough. And that would still allow us to meet the November fifth. Uh, city council fee deadlines. Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, Jeff, I don't think we're that far off. I think that just probably uh, the two and a half percent works for me. It may not work for others, but it works for me um, uh, on most of these. I think uh, I think there may be an opportunity to tweak though, and and think carefully about uh, some of the, some of the points that were made tonight, and uh, and then we can revisit it uh, at that meeting. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Um, then next is the uh, fitness center uh, fee recommendation. And again, uh, we go out and we look at membership comparisons and we, uh, we look at uh, the surrounding uh, communities and their, um, their fitness centers to get an idea of what we're uh, charging. So uh, again, we use Lake Bluff as our, the measuring stick by which uh, we um, look at our fees and uh, we are <clears throat> We're at for a, a resident. We're at 362 for an individual. They're at um, uh, 380. So um, we're right, you know, in, in line with what uh, they do. Um, you know, when we get into the, some of the private uh, fitness centers, uh, that's where we we start to see um, a big increase uh, or difference between what we're able to offer or what we charge and what they uh, charge. Um, Next thing uh, we do is uh, we look at, um, we get an idea of the, again, the revenue uh, growth chart. Uh, we take uh, the number of memberships. Uh, we took it this year, we took a two year average to kind of see where uh, we can go and put in a little bit of a, a 2% uh, increase or, uh, in, in growth. Uh, and we um, project that out to kind of see where um, the, a two and a half percent uh, increase might put us, and we're at a differential over um, FY15 of uh, 14302. Um, the uh, third one, which actually probably should be the, the second one, is we, we take um, three figures. We, we, we want a two and a half uh, percent for um, the fitness center because we anticipated in, in doing the two and a half uh, percent for uh, the lakefront, just keep things consistent uh, between uh, facilities. And again, no, you, no big major capital projects going on, keeping up with staff costs, uh, that sort of thing. So we can kind of see where, um, what a 2%, two percent, two and a half, and a 3% uh, would, would get us. So we decided to go with um, the, the two and a half percent. Um, so um, we are recommending a two and a half percent increase to resident and non-resident fee categories with the exception of the senior individual and the senior couple, which will maintain the 25% discount off of those respective individual um, memberships. So, um, any questions? Dare I ask? Yeah, <laughs> uh, you, you, you know us uh, pretty well. I, I, I wonder about um, participation trends at the fitness center. I know, um, uh, I, I seem to remember a number around 1,200 being uh, being uh, you know the the usage number. But I'm I mean the total number of members I'm curious about over the last few years, and I'm also curious about overall usage of the facility in terms of you know visits and that type of thing. Do you have that information? That type of information? Um, uh, not the end. Of, you know, I'm sorry. <coughs> Um, we can get that information. I believe that's part of it. That's in the class registration system. So as, as everybody comes in, their, their, their pass is scanned so we can get a facility use uh, report done um, where we'd have to work with. I mean, pricing, you know, pricing is, is really, you know, it's really a, a supply demand exercise. And it's really important to me before we make pricing decisions, particularly relative to that facility, um, that that does get used a lot by a lot of people, and uh, you know we ought to we ought to kind of know how how are we doing? Are we? Uh, you know, I looked just at at your competitive uh, information, and I thought it was great to see all that, and I was surprised by how low we are um, pricing wise, and uh, particularly since we just put a bunch of new capital in that place. I mean, the place is looking great. You know, I'm really happy with how it looks, and. Um, 
uh, I don't know. I'm, I, that, that was my reaction. But anytime you're making pricing decisions, you really want to know, hey, is, is usage increasing? Is it decreasing? Is membership increasing or decreasing? And then what's the P&L look like? Are we covering costs? Are we, you know, are we more than covering costs? How does all that look? Yeah, um, we, um, with this, um, with this uh, price increase, um, we're about a 10% profit margin, um, at least for the FY15. We haven't prepared the FY16 budgets, but, you know, we would take um, that into consideration because um, there's a lot of different elements that make up the fitness budget. So there are certain programs that can be tweaked that, that the, um, the board does not um, need to approve. These are just membership fees. Um, our, um, our membership account month to month fluctuates quite a bit. Um, you see a, a, a lot of, um, you see more use in the winter months, um, especially you see a, a big, you know, a bump in December, January, when everybody's making their New Year's resolutions. Um, we um, make considerations for snowbirds. Uh, they can stop their membership, start back up when they come in. So we use um, August as a, a guideline um, every year as to where we are with memberships and then kind of uh, and then kind of project out from there. So we're, we're, um, per, we're you're um, approving or recommending um, making recommendations for sorry um, fees um, that don't go in effect until uh, May 1 of this 2015. So it's really hard to to kind of figure out where everything is, you know, at, at any given time. So sure. I, is, no, I understand it. Although, although I do think there would be ways to figure it out, um, for, or at least to get a sense for, for, for overall usage, for example, the total number of visits, you know, on a trailing 12 month right. basis would be a good statistic to look at for the fitness center. Right. We have, we have the, the class system, the registration system has, um, my understanding and talking to the office manager has some limitations and, and that's one of the big reasons why we're moving over to the, uh, a new registration system that would be given, would give us better, uh, do reporting, uh, but, uh, have, having not really kind of looked into it yet, I would have to go to her and say, this is, this is kind of the trending information that I would need. Am I right in assuming that since it's, since it's September and we don't, we, these don't go into effect till May, we've got some time on this. We can, well, city council, yeah, city council approves all fees in November. So we, we have to you know, make that recommendation to city council so we can come back in for the October meeting and again, and then still have time to, to I, make the deadline. I don't know how, go ahead, Mary. Um, I was gonna say that, I mean, we did a spotlight on fitness not too, not too long ago that uh, we did cover our membership trends, you know, what's happened with that. We had some usage numbers right there. We do have um, some issues with, um, consistency of swiping members in when they use the fitness center and I'm not sure that our data is as comprehensive and complete as I think the volume of usage is. There is increased competition as you know in the community when the college opened their fitness area that student rec center but not residents can also take a membership out there with the college there's private studios in town so the industry has become you know, much more competitive, I would say, in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, we've been pretty much holding, we, we've decreased uh, from when I got here in 2007, but we've been holding pretty steady around the 1,200 membership mark now. As Jeff said, <coughs> we have, um, you know, tried to do some different marketing in the last few years. I think we've really, you know, tried to reach out and get some specials going, or wave initiation fees and that kind of thing. So. I think it's still a very well used facility. I don't have numbers here tonight, unfortunately, to share with you. Um, we do have to stay competitive. That's why we placed equipment and um, we had safety issues because some of it was breaking. So I appreciated that support from the you know, park board and council recently. So and we can certainly get you more on that. But I mean, the list that you're seeing here is a lot of the competition in our area. I think that their fees are provided, you know, there for you to look at. Um, but I don't. You know, I, I'm not sure that, uh, again, raising our fees too much might put us out of the ballpark of those that we most consistently 
I mean, it's it's true. Although although if you look at the if you look at the couple and the family compared to our most close competitor, which is Lake Bluff, and I don't I, I'm I was uh, I'm not sure of this, but your documents say that uh, Lake Bluff, sorry, Lake Forest College isn't taking anybody new. We heard today that perhaps they're taking individual members, but not families. But if we just compare versus Lake Bluff, we're quite a bit lower on. Uh, families and couples I mean quite a bit lower hundreds of dollars so did you have something you wanted to say Charlie yeah a couple a couple things uh, first of all when I go into the locker room with my with my and my, my slides guard does uh, does that get logged or that's not part of your computer system currently it does not track right. it that's one of the advantages we will have when we have the new system you'll be able to do that in yeah. the future yeah. I think the other thing is these numbers don't reflect the total number of members, do they? Um, these, well, we run a report. The report it gives us a time membership on, time count. On, time on. If, if yeah. you run these numbers, you get 1201 if you just add all these up. Mm -hmm. But but the, there are two in every couple, there are two people, and in every family, there's a minimum of three. So I look at these numbers and say there are really 800 more people, 800 to 840 more people using the fitness center, or members at least. I don't know how much they use it. That's one in every ten residents in the, in the community. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that's that's something that um, we can uh, I can check with the the office manager. She's really um, sort of our go-to expert when it comes to the class system and see uh, see about that report and see if there is if it can generate that kind of that information. Again, I mean, she, you know, I mean, you got if you add up the numbers that are in here, not right. accounting for double couples and three in the sure. in the family, you get twelve oh one. Right. So I, I run the numbers and say there's closer to 2,000. With certainly check, we can certainly check on, on that to make sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think it's fair. I mean, Mary, I'm 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 actually directionally, uh, you know, fine with with a with an, a modest increase, but it does feel like there's an opportunity on on couples and families. It also does feel to me like. Our, uh, it would be a good thing to invest in in a in a better tracking system, so we really can. Because you, as you point out, we're in a very competitive situation. We want to know what usage looks like, um, and how trends are looking. And 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 I I I know we saw some of that data before, but to Charlie's point, and and you were pointing out the issue around you know it's like what point in the year do you measure it and so forth and. You, it almost feels like you got to look at a trailing 12 month, you know, number each month and, and, uh, and, and look at probably a few different metrics to really understand it. I mean, this is a pretty, it's pretty uh, large revenue stream for the, for the city and it's probably worth having, having a better way to track it, sounds like. Right. And, uh, one of the things, we, we had a really good meeting uh, this past Friday. We met with the Buffalo Grove um, Park District because they currently have the software system that we're going to be moving to we Vermont. To, what's that? The Vermont, Vermont one. Yeah, Vermont systems, and we wanted to see what they've experienced with their installation and tracking. And um, I had the opportunity to go with Jason Bustecker, our fitness manager. We we split up kind of into different you know pods if you will to talk with their staff. And I was in the fitness area with them. And um, you know one of the interesting things that uh, they do there is they don't offer families and they don't offer couples. It's just an individual price and then it's an add-on fee for anybody you know or they all just they do it two way different ways residents it's just by individual and then non-residents have an add-on plus um plus uh, 25 percent so or you know an additional fee on top of that for the add-on so you know there's different ways to slice and dice this industry as far as gen fee generation and i think our new software will be something we'll have to build it you know, to reflect what we, how we want to track these records. But, um, you know, it's, uh, we continue to, to try to, you know, keep our toe in this door and be an active and viable alternative for those who, you know, don't want to pay the higher club fees. So, well, to, but, to Charlie's but point, we can certainly look at the fees some more if you want to increase. It's just, again, justification for it and, you know, um, comfort level of how much that would be. Mm hmm do, do we have a cutoff of uh, membership? Are we at a certain ceiling or no. not? We've had three times as many members in the past, at least the way we measure it. 
for our for our floor size, I think we're we're probably closer into you know comfort zone is the max as an example would be about thirty five hundred members. That would be as that would be packed all thirty five hundred you know, measured the same way the twelve oh one is measured. Right. Yeah. Right. That's the industry kind of mm-hmm. standard. Which is a lot, really a lot, to your point, Charlie, it's a lot more than 3,500. It would be a lot more than 3,500 members, yeah. So we're a ways off that. But there's some times when it's, there's, you know, a fair amount of activity over there. I think one of the things we're wrestling to is just our identity. You know, we're the Lake Forest Fitness Center. It gets confused with the hospital <laughs> a lot. Um, you know, just... It's a hard thing to re- to to market so people know that there's a fitness center within the rec center because it's the same title, and so we don't have a way to make that as a fitness business as a, a standalone marketing identity. So we've been wrestling with names for a little while. We haven't come up yet with a, a good suggested name, um, but we're working on that part of it too because we think we should rebrand it. And we should, you know, take advantage of trying to let people know that we have a fitness center in there. That's one of the great things when we did the book sale was having that foot traffic come in the building. I can't tell you how many people said they didn't know we had a rec center. So, is that I mean, a, really a fitness true? Fitness center, I should say. Oh, fitness oh. center. Okay. Yeah. Largely fitness because center. they couldn't get a parking spot. <laughs> where it was reserved for the uh, rec center, probably. Well, I think they did pretty well holding spots. So we were at least, yeah. yeah there was a, a point at which we went. Uh, during the books sale and there were uh, spots held aside I was happy to see for fitness yeah and there was a sign that said you can't park here and yeah. now we didn't have anybody stopping people we, when I was there we did they did, they had, they, on, did they? on Friday they had yeah. okay good that's good to hear other comments well, I guess my one quick comment you know I mean I, I do view membership in in the rec facility as a discretionary spend. And so I, I do think we need to be quite careful. I think a bit of it is a, uh, it's a um, spur of the moment spend, I think. And I think it's discretionary. And so, you know, I would be careful to be pushing up the fees a lot more in this area, just knowing the level of competition and um, the fact that once we get people in, there's various other revenue alternative source, whether it's the personal trainers, whether it's the classes that we offer and so on and so forth. So um, for my money's worth, I'm, I'm happy pushing it at two and a half, but I wouldn't necessarily push the envelope. That's that's Dave Brush. Other comments? I agree with that. Okay. I agree. All right. So not a lot of love for increases. Um, do we want to wait or do we want to make, does someone want to make a motion today? I'd like to see the membership data again. And since we're going to talk about the sailing in our next meeting, can we push this off another month? I'm happy with that. Mm-hmm. Jeff, you okay with that? Yes, sir. You want to come visit us uh, <laughs> next month? <laughs> I love standing in front of you guys. That's okay. great. So, Jeff, just to be specific, I'm looking at Exhibit 2 and your third column over with, the, with data. You've got two-year averages on memberships. If you can just provide three actual years' data. By those same categories, that would be helpful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Memberships and three years. You said. Yeah, just the last three fiscal years. What have those membership counts been in each of those categories? Okay. That'd be helpful to at, see. At, at the same date, right. right? Which is the August time. However, period you were talking came about. up with these. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Welcome. Uh, next item on our agenda is the Emerald Ash Borer Program Update. Peter. I've never been so happy to hear about the Ash Borer. <laughs> <laughs> you have good news tonight, Peter? I think so, um, although I'll let you guys decide that. So good evening, uh, Chairman Hill, members of the Park Board. I'm here tonight to give you some information on Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, keep in mind, this is just uh, some information on this year's program. Uh, although uh, at some point during this uh, PowerPoint presentation, you will see some finances. I'm certainly happy to discuss those with you. It's probably better off that we look at uh, discussing those through our CIP. Um, also, I left you some information uh, on your chairs, which I'll discuss with you uh, further as well. 
So uh, as you can see on the simple pie chart, uh, we come up with a number of 7,227. Uh, that represents the number of inventory trees. Uh, you may recall over the last two years, we have come before city council and the park board to ask for tree inventory. Uh, these are trees that are inventoried on the city rights of way, uh, the parks, cemetery, and other city owned facilities. There is probably about a five to 10% uh, discrepancy in the total ash tree population on city properties versus the inventory um, properties. And that's for ancillary properties that maybe we don't get to unimproved right of And certainly I'll discuss that with you as we move on. But uh, all of this has been documented, right? And you're use, using the software that uh, we purchased? 95% of it's been documented. Uh, we did go ahead and determine a threshold of about five to eight inches uh, per ash tree per diameter. So therefore there is a number of trees that don't fit that threshold, uh, including a number of uh, right-of-ways that weren't inventoried. And when I mean right-of-ways, these are right-of-ways that may be on private property, but the city maintains utility easements. So not your typical right-of-way. So basically uh, what we've done over the last several years is we, we broke down uh, our Emerald Ash Borough program in treatments, removals, and replacements. Uh, this gives you an idea of where we are in FY15. and uh, our treatments, we've spent about $22,000 uh, this year. We budgeted 35. That kind of shows you uh, how rapidly some of the trees declined and one weren't worth treating. Uh, with our EAB removals, we've budgeted 200000 This is actually an uptick of about $50,000 from last year. Currently, we spend about $88,000 through our contract. Uh, this is actually going ahead and uh, giving the money or awarding the contract to our second lowest bidder. Our first lowest bidder actually backed out of our contract, which is the second time this has happened to us. Luckily, through uh, City Council, PPL, uh, and the Park Board, uh, everybody had unanimously voted to give the lowest top three bidders uh, the contract, and subsequently, it's really worked out for us the last two years, because uh, like I said, the lowest bidder has actually backed out, um, gotten in a little bit over their head. Uh, both times, we've been able to default to Kanukin, who has been our second uh, lowest bidder, and they've really uh, worked well with the city, uh, very um, punctual in the removals. Uh, also, very, uh, they do a great job in communicating to us where they're going to be, uh, and hopefully we do the same to the residents as well by putting out our community signs you may have seen on Deer Path and other streets where we're talking about our emerald ash borer removal. Lastly, we have our tree replacement. Uh, we are at about $100,000, although you'll see $65,000 is carried over from FY14. Uh, the reason being is that you may recall the horrible winter we had. We couldn't get into the fields and dig these plants, so we had the foresight to roll this money over into FY15 uh, and then use it in uh, calendar year 14 to go ahead and do more planting in the spring than we typically would. So going back through our program of treatment, removals, and uh, planting, uh, I wanted to give you an idea of the treatment uh, and how effective it is. This literally is a treated tree to the left that the city's uh, doing and an untreated tree to the right. And as I mentioned before, this kind of looks like a commercial for treatment. Uh, shows you the effectiveness of the product that we're using. Uh, the city is using triage, which is a two-year chemical injected treatment. Uh, the tree on the right-hand side is being untreated. Uh, and these two trees literally sit next to each other, each other at the intersection of Arbor and Windridge. So if you were to drive down that street, you would actually see Windridge is not being treated by the city. Uh, Arbor is being treated by the city and a distinct difference in the canopy uh, and certainly the health of the trees. So uh, we have identified approximately 650 trees that we feel are worth treating. Uh, these are trees that make up 90% or more on one given street. For example, this is Arbor. Uh, you may go across another street like Harlan where the majority of the trees are ash and the treatments are working really well. Um, we have uh, tried to save trees on other streets, but on a unfortunately have not been effective. Uh, and some of that's either by getting there too late or using other products early on in the emerald ash borer process. Removals uh, certainly are grabbing a lot of attention. Uh, people who see treated trees don't necessarily know that they're being treated and they have a propensity to drive by those trees and take them for granted. Uh, though when people see dead trees standing all over, not only in private property, but also in city property, there's really an attention to those trees. Uh, first thing that comes to people's minds are obviously the sheer number of trees. Uh, the city is projected to lose over 100,000 trees throughout the community. Uh, and secondly, uh, is always safety. You know, 
uh, are these trees going to fall? Uh, are the city's trees going to fall? Or even more importantly, are the residential trees going to fall? So we've seen an uptick in phone calls uh, from our residents um, asking about the city's <coughs> trees, but also asking about their neighbor's trees and what the neighbors are doing uh, to get those trees down. This just happens to be on Old Mill Road. These trees were removed last year uh, and already replanted, uh, but you can see how that has such a dramatic appearance on the streetscape, and I'll be able to show you the new trees here in a second. I mentioned that we have inventoried about 90 to 95% of our tree population. When we get into areas like this, this happens to be West Laurel, you can see how many trees are there. Uh, not only ash trees, but buckthorn trees, things that don't meet that threshold of being uh, anywhere of eight inches in diameter. Uh, unfortunately, those trees still die and we need to address them. And so those aren't necessarily in our active inventory uh, and therefore um, really only get noticed when they're dead. Uh, we have, uh, as a section, tagged over 1,700 counting city trees that need to be removed by the city of Lake Forest. We have identified over 3,700 private trees that need to be removed by the residents of Lake Forest, unfortunately at their cost, uh, that pose a public health and safety threat. Trees that may fall on the sidewalk, may fall on the roadway, uh, and may fall into perhaps even power lines. So we've identified those trees and are in the process of sending uh, the residents letters. So when it comes to removals, we used to take uh, kind of an approach of a 30-day time frame. We realize for the city and for the residents that's just not appropriate anymore because of the sheer number of trees and the limited number of contractors we're all kind of sharing those contractors and so really our encouragement is to get these on the schedule as quickly as you can get multiple bids to find out that you're getting the best prices and to get these trees down in a reasonable time I mentioned to you that we've tagged about 1,800 city trees. Uh, our goal is really to get them down in the next 12 months. Uh, and so we're going to be working in the rears, and certainly we can expedite that with more money. Uh, but as I'll show you, giving more money doesn't necessarily save more money in the long run. Uh, and I can go ahead and show you that in a little bit. What people seem to forget is that trees are still dying for Dutch elm disease. Uh, they're dying from things like... Um, fire blight like the crab apple picture in the middle and you may require remember the drought uh, several years ago uh, where the sugar <laughs> maple unfortunately has died uh, this just happens to be on Cherry Avenue. For those of you who are familiar with Cherry Avenue, it's not a very large street. As a matter of fact, it's a dead-end street. Probably has maybe 16 homes on it. So to lose an elm uh, of that significance, which really took the city almost over a year to get ComEd to top, you can see the wires there, uh, and to remove a cherry tree and a sugar maple tree, uh, that really adds a lot of tree loss. It really changes the dynamics of uh, just that small street. And so that's not in the same magnitude as we're actually talking with ash tree removals, where if you were to go down Wedgwood, for example, you could see 40 to 50 percent tree mortality and loss. Replacement, uh, this is Old Mill. Uh, like I talked about, the uh, slide uh, seems a little bit darker from where I'm at, but you may also notice that uh, these trees have gator bags on it. That's a way for us to water, to conserve water, uh, to really focus on 20 gallons of water right on that tree ball. We actually used to water uh, by hand uh, for a while. It was really kind of efficient for us. We could actually probe uh, the trees, but there was a lot of runoff. It took a lot more time. So we've been able to get the watering per tree, uh, 20 gallons down to one minute per tree and that certainly helps us in our efficiencies uh, as well as maintaining our watering schedule of about every seven to 10 days. Uh, you may have noticed these bags in the community uh, and one day maybe notice they're gone and that's because we rotate them because I strongly believe that leaving these bags uh, on the trees, it just invites things like rodents and critters, frogs and earwigs. And so we try to give uh, these trees obviously some natural rain when it does rain and some air um, and into the soil. So I talked to you about a number of uh, different budget items that we'll be coming for uh, before you and city council with. Uh, they really fall into that same category of a replacement treatment uh, and removal. You can see here, uh, as we're projected to go out for a number of years uh, on this option one budget, we can certainly get through a lot of these removals by FY18. Um, that brings us to about $1.5 million. Um, keep in mind, one of the numbers I want you to focus on is the replacement costs. This is strictly for ash replacement. This doesn't include the elm that I showed you. It doesn't include the crab or the sugar maple. This really just focuses on the replacement of ash trees. Historically, before Emerald Ash Borer came here, uh, we were at anywhere from a low of $50,000 to a high of $150,000 uh, for our replacement. And so you can go ahead and extrapolate that out by adding that many more trees to figure out where we would need to be to go ahead and replace all the trees that unfortunately we're losing. And this, op this option one reflects what is the current city's 
EAB management plan that we had always intended to, to pursue, which was <coughs> aggressive removals, replanting at a level that staff could maintain and treating what was appropriate to maintain over, you know, a multi-year window. So, right. Peter, and why are the, the removal costs, uh, why do they end in FY18? Uh, because of that number I showed you of 7,227, that's based on the current inventory minus what we're treating. Um, that also uh, doesn't take, what the number you're not seeing is that the in-house removals that we project to do is roughly 600 trees in-house per year, uh, which will go ahead and get the removals done quicker. So all city trees will be removed by the end of FY18? All untreated city trees. And, but you said earlier we're still expecting 100,000 Community citywide. Wide. Citywide. So yep. it's so this probably is the not, city's budget. Right. So we we do we expect to, that residents will continue to have to deal with this well past FY18? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, yeah. residents are supposed to have dealt with it before then, right? But we just don't expect that they all will. So uh, that's a good point. Um, you know, this has been in the community since 2009. Um, and actually, we may not have been at this point if we ourselves would have budgeted money in 2009 and started to call these out sooner. Um, but a lot of people still are in denial. Um, they don't realize that these trees are going to die if they're not treating them. Uh, one of the things that we have noticed is that green ash uh, is a tree that seems to be infested sooner than white ash. And so that's actually buying us some time as far as our removals go. Uh, the threat of the removals uh, as far as the trees declining on a greater basis. Um, and so this does focus strictly on what's inventoried. It does focus primarily on the parkways, although it takes into account the golf course, the cemetery, and some of the parks. Um, and so um, that number that could still be out there is at 10% of the unknown, you know, some of these trees that either um, aren't showing signs, were never inventoried, or come up on some of these properties. And, and I can share a picture of actually one of those properties for you uh, here shortly. Did I answer that question? Thank you. So we have another option here, and that's uh, our more aggressive, aggressive option too. And you'll see when you look at the bottom line, it's about $150,000 higher. Uh, the removals actually come out one year sooner. Um, and what you're uh, not necessarily taking in account by looking at this is that this allows city staff to do one more year of removals in-house of approximately 600 trees, which um, really balances out to be at about $150,000. Keep in mind, this is a dynamic system, so we're doing this based on averages. And so our average tree size is about $15. Average tree removal cost is about $250. Um, and so when we go ahead and we elongate this process, we actually are doing more in-house, therefore paying less out of our pocket contractually, uh, and then coming up with a better number. Now, keep in mind, uh, this is the best case scenario. If all of a sudden our ash trees take a turn for the worse, we get really bad storms like we had a couple weeks ago and ash trees start falling that we felt confident at one point that we're going to stand, that may go ahead and exacerbate the problem and therefore uh, we may need to look at going to this more aggressive style. Um, it doesn't necessarily uh, change the treatment. Treatment you'll see is pretty static as we go forward. Mm -hmm. um, what it does though is it does increase the planting uh, price to get those trees replaced. Um, early on, we had talked about a tree for tree replacement. We find as we go through this, uh, we're approximately planting 530 to 560 trees for every 1700 that we're removing. So when I go back to this slide right here of Laura Avenue, um, we're not going to be replanting any of those trees that you see that have dead tops. There's just for good forestry practices, there's no room. Uh, there's already a wooded streetscape. And so we may take out 20 trees, but we may not put one back in. Uh, and certainly that's the case on a lot of these roads like Sheridan Road, Green Bay Road, more of these eclectic mixes of trees that follow kind of older homes, older estates. When we get into the newer subdivisions out west where we have that standard 40 foot spacing of trees, those are the subdivisions that you see replaced. Um, you know, we are working with some active homeowners association, for example, Middle Fork, uh, as well as Arbor Ridge, which is the Lawrence area off of uh, Telegraph Road, um, to get their trees out early and to get them replaced um, because they have more active boards. They have smaller trees, so the impact is actually less, uh, and it's been quite a successful program. So um, for those of you attending the Lake Forest Open Lands Bonfire here in uh, two weeks, you'll see a lot of those diseased ashes going up in smoke. <laughs> which also helped keep our costs down, by the way. 
So again, not really focusing on the budget. We really want to save this for our CIP. Um, you can see that uh, staying kind of status quo with the current funding, uh, we're looking at about $1.5 million. Uh, going ahead and being a little bit more aggressive, and aggressive really only has the benefit when it comes to uh, the tree removal, um, as far as we're concerned, giving us more trees to plant and maintain off the bat doesn't necessarily equate to a successful tree planting program if we can't maintain them. Uh, you see that this is kind of a uh, increase of approximately 150,000. One of the things that we've really worked hard on, uh, I think, is to uh, partner with some of our outside organizations. Uh, you may have been to last year's fall tree sale or even this past spring's tree and plant sale with Lake Forest Open Lands. Uh, this October 18th, we will be having our second annual fall tree sale where we offer to residents um, basically trees at city cost with a slight uh, regreening fee of about $5, so very insignificant. Residents can purchase trees from uh, about $70 on up to about $220. We do offer uh, delivery services as well as planting services through Wright Landscape, uh, who is a partner with Lake Forest Open Lands. Um, and we found it to be very beneficial. Uh, we are really promoting uh, native trees. We are trying to encourage residents not to plant maples because they actually make up a much greater um, population density than our ash trees. And so therefore we're trying to get rid of that crutch everyone has about going to maples or asking for something with great fall color that grows quickly. That seems to be the default for everybody. And so we want to let them know through this plant sale that there's a number of oak species available, uh, hickories, um, persimmons, uh, quaking aspens, white pine. Um, and it's really uh, worked out well for ourselves and certainly for Lake Forest Open Lands and kind of getting the word out. Um, uh, there is some pre-orders that are being taken through Lake Forest Open Lands um, website as well as you can get to that link through the city's website at cityoflakeforest.com. Um, and so really want to encourage residents um, to start thinking about regreening. Um, certainly, uh, this is a good opportunity to get the right tree in the right area. So many people have inherited ash trees over the years. They were there when the house was either built or when they bought the house, and this really is an opportunity. Uh, and we feel it's a really good economical opportunity. So um, obviously, it's one more chance to promote our sale here, um, but more importantly, uh, to answer any questions that you guys might have. Any questions? I just comment, I was at your tree sale this spring and it was really, really well received in my opinion. My understanding is you sold out pretty quickly. Uh, we did really well, thank you. Yeah, it was fantastic and look forward to the one in October. So um, I might wanna add uh, the information I provided you uh, before I forget. Um, that is a spreadsheet that I have, uh, the forestry section has developed to show you really where we've been over the course of the last four months. Uh, keep in mind those numbers that you have don't reflect the numbers that I just showed you. This is based on a worst case scenario con contractual planting um, only, but it also talks about the diseased elms that uh, we sometimes have a, um, uh, reason to forget about because everybody's so wrapped up in the ash trees. So it shows you what we've tagged on private property, it shows you what we've identified in private property. Uh, we've actually taken it to the level of how many trees per ward, um, how many trees on main roads, how many trees on side roads. And so, um, you know, for a number of years, we had come forward talking to you about emerald ash borer, but really didn't have any base data. Um, I think last year and certainly this year, we have that base data. So as we move forward, we can give you guys more factual information. Keep in mind, it's still dynamic. We're still going ahead and basing it on averages. You have your low bidder back out, that changes your numbers. Um, and so those are somewhat fluid uh, in this process. And so um, I think you'll find that that information is very detailed. I think it's very specific on what we were able to accomplish since June 9th of this year. Uh, and I certainly credit the forestry staff in putting that together. Peter, it feels to me like you guys are doing a terrific job managing what is a really, really terrible tragedy for the, uh, for the city. Um, uh, you know, I think we all see it when we drive around. It, it, the 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 canopy has already changed uh, dramatically, and um, based on what you're saying, it's going to keep changing. So, um, you know, keep at it, fight the good fight. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. 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 Um, we've got a spotlight. Uh, on special events, Mr. Mobile, you've been extremely patient, and 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 this is your this is your time. All right, thank you, Mr. Hill, our Chairman Hill, and members of the board. Um, 
the Parks and Recreation staff has long realized that Lake Forest is a special place to live. Therefore, staff have uh, taken a lot of time to plan and implement various special events that meet the needs of our community. In our own unique way, Parks and Recreation Department endeavors to provide fun programming opportunities uh, through a variety of special events throughout the year. We also develop events that include multi-generations and all family dynamics within the community. And we design events to enhance the character of the community. Through the programming of special events, staff strive to provide family style entertainment, a means to bring families together, and we provide a core of holiday programming to enlighten you know, holidays for our families. Our 33 family events help to strengthen the social fabric of the community and allows families to create lasting memories, make new friends. Um, it's a, uh, a, a chance to meet neighbors, to, you know, to better build those relationships, as well as to explore our beautiful parks and our facilities that we have in the community. Um, this slide is a calendar of our events. Not all of them are up here, but our larger events are. And you can see that throughout the calendar year, we provide uh, many, many different events. And some months have multiple events, which give the families opportunities to connect with one another. These, are, these events range from small programs where fees are charged to uh, several large community events that encompass you know, anyone who wants to join us. For our larger community events, we do build partnerships within the community. Uh, we currently have sponsorships with Lake Forest Bank and Trust, L3 Capital, who are the owners of Market Square, as well as Forest Orthodontics and Pediatric Dentistry. Lake Forest Bank and Trust and L3 Capital, they sponsor our concerts in the Square Series for the summer um, outdoor concerts. And Forest Orthodontics and Pediatric Dentistry for the past, I mean, many years, have sponsored our Easter egg hunt and our Halloween party, which this year is uh, called the Halloween Tricks and Treats. So it's great to be able to build those types of relationships that provide you know, funding uh, for our events. Moving forward for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna focus on our three larger events. And the first one on the screen is the Easter egg hunt. This is our annual egg hunt that we provide for the community, which is usually the Saturday prior to Easter weekend. We hold it at Deer Path Community School and Park weather permitting, you know, this year it'll be in March, so hopefully we can still be outdoors. But the event provides, you know, games, crafts, pictures with the Easter Bunny, um, entertainment, you know, before or afterwards, as well as the popular egg hunt. Uh, annually, we have, you know, three to 400 people that attend this event. Our second one, our concerts in the square. Each summer, um, we provide seven weeks of music in Market Square, basically turning the square into our own outdoor concert venue. So on Thursdays from 6.30 to 8.30 um, in June and July, we will bring in a different band each week, you know, encompassing many genres of music. And families come out, set up their areas with chairs, blankets, um, and, you know, enjoy their food and uh, really just spend a nice quality family evening together. And it's a great opportunity to be able to just get out and relax, you know, after a, a, a week of work. So I've got a clip. So that was Libido Funk Circus, which was our final concert of the summer this year. And basically every week we get a group of kids that come up front and dance and have a great time while the parents are sitting back and enjoying their company with their friends, neighbors, family. And it's not just in the square. I mean, we have people sitting up and down both sides of Market Square. And now that we've built the relationship and continue with Lake Forest Bank and Trust, but built the relationship with the owners of the square, we're hoping to be able to you know, continue and, and, and you know, 
keep bringing in some, some great musical entertainment. You know, depending on weather, and we've been lucky um, every week we've been able to hold it this summer, but, you know, we have anywhere from a couple hundred to, you know, several, maybe eight, you know, car show brings in how close to a thousand people probably up in the square. So it is a great event. And then our final event, which is actually quickly approaching us, is we uh, provide our Halloween Tricks and Treats event. And that is a Halloween party that we host at the Recreation Center. And this year it's going to be on Halloween on the 31st from 5 to 8 p.m. Um, hopefully, you know, it'll encompass the kids can go out and trick or treat because it is geared towards grade school and younger. And then they can come and finish their evening with us or start our evening with us and go back out. But it gives them a, a great opportunity to have some Halloween fun in a safe environment. And also, depending on weather, you know, they might want to come inside. But basically, at this event, we have games, we have crafts. We have a uh, hayride around our building with many decorations set up. We have a uh, sensory laboratory where kids can feel different objects. And uh, we bring in the reptiles and uh, they have their own area set up in a, in a semi-haunted experience. And then we do have our popular haunted house that we provide as well. And annually, you know, we've had, you know, four to 500 people that have come through our building in that amount of time. and. So, you know, I'm encouraging everybody to put on their costumes and, and make us a part of their Halloween because it is such a great event that we, that we put on. So I'm going to end it here with any questions, uh, comments? The only comment I have is that, uh, you know, 21,000 uh, people is a lot of people, and you guys make a, a huge positive impact with all those events. And... Uh, and and I for one appreciate it. So other other comments. Everybody agree. I hope. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. I'd like to end it with just saying that, you know, having some nice big community events that no charge is a great way just for everyone to get out and come and enjoy themselves, um, whether it's holiday or Smeltorama or Frost Fest or whatever it might be. Just come on out and enjoy the facilities and, and enjoy uh, the programming that we can provide. So thank you. Thank you. I, 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 thank you, Joe. I, I just make one other one other comment, which is, um, you know, it is it is great for people to come out and attend those. Um, I've watched firsthand how much time and effort staff puts into those events, um, and it and and we notice and we appreciate it. So thank you. thanks for that, um, Mary. Uh, well, I'll just add, um, under my director's report, a couple things to add to Joe's list. As he mentioned, he couldn't go possibly go through them all tonight, but we do have some events coming up in October um, that, uh, just to mention to the community at home as well, we've got a school day off program that the Wildlife Discovery Center is going to be holding on um, October 14th. We've got a variety of preschool workshops that are Halloween, fall themed, so you can register for the uh, infamous Croctoberfest, which is an important fundraiser for the Wildlife Discovery Center, is going to be on October 26th. And then, of course, we'll go into a variety of Thanksgiving related items, which I won't you know, go over too many of those. But again, very busy season for that. And dance also has um, a few events coming up as well. So um, in addition to that, as we know, Dan Jessica, as you mentioned, started at the beginning of the board uh, meeting, he has stepped down. Um, so we are in the search for a new board member. So if you have uh, individuals that you think would be well um, uh, fit for our organization, our, our board, if you could uh, encourage them to apply through the caucus, the caucus will be conducting the search to find a replacement. They've for already us. started that search. I, I got a call from yeah, I think they Joanne have, this so, morning. But, yeah. um, so we are hoping to fill the position hopefully quickly. Um, we already mentioned Hunter's resignation. He is going to be big shoes to fill, but we do have a detailed timeline uh, that we're hoping to, to continue to work towards and have a highly qualified replacement. Hunter has also shared a number of names with us as well for potential candidates, so uh, we will uh, be working on that also as well. The, um, the last thing is I wanted to mention to the board, as we've done for the last you know six years, I believe, we've had an October workshop specifically related to um, uh, capital. And so uh, we're looking at whether or not we want to hold that as a separate workshop or on the October park board meeting. So um, 
I don't know if you guys have any preferences. We will have fees to bring back for the October committee of the whole meeting now, uh, but we could put it all together and just make it your October meeting if that's the preference of the board. So I just wanted to get a sense of what your interest might be related to that. I'm good. One. Yeah. Do one meeting and just do it all together. Okay, so we will do our, our capital improvement uh, program recommendations uh, at the October meeting then. So, and that concludes my report for tonight. Terrific. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. Are there any comments from any board members? None. <laughs> we've, we've, had, we've had lots of chances to comment today. No, no comments. Okay. I move for adjournment. Second. Chairman Hill. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Aye. Aye. Good meeting. Great.